Climate activists are gluing themselves to gallery walls and throwing soup at masterpieces. They say their aim is to force people to pay attention to the environmental crisis, but it's not obvious that they're increasing support as a result. In cities across Europe, from Madrid to London, protesters are resorting to new tactics. It's not just about throwing food in galleries, but also stopping traffic on major roads causing massive disruption. Is this a strategy that wins or loses the sympathy of the public, though? Welcome to the program, I'm Philip Hampshire. In their desperation to make people pay attention to the climate crisis facing humanity and to protest what they see as the inaction of governments, the tactics of environmental activists have become ever more brazen. Among the paintings chosen as targets, so far there are masterpieces from the likes of Van Gogh, Da Vinci and Monet. Britain's busiest motorway, the M25, is constantly brought to a standstill, and there have been stories that people have missed funerals and other important family events because of the chaos that's being caused. So, is it possible to defend these climate shock tactics? Joining us to discuss this, well, in Norfolk, we've got Rupert Reid. He's the co-director of the Moderate Flank Incubator. Meanwhile, in Newcastle, we have Alex de Koning, who is uh, of Just Stop Oil. He's a spokesperson for them and a climate scientist. Meanwhile, in Wealth, we have Sally Hickson, who's Associate Professor of Art History at the University of Wealth. Thank you, all three of you, for joining me. If I can bring, uh, begin with you, uh, Rupert, um, you're not only at the Moderate flank incubator, you also helped to launch Extinction Rebellion. So I, I feel like it's fitting to say to you, why are these people doing these protests and why now? Well, uh, I think you, you'll have to ask the uh, Just Stop Oil person for a direct answer to that question. But look, I think it is really important that all of us seek to understand why people feel driven to the kinds of lengths that Just Stop Oil have recently gone to. It's really important to empath empathize with the people, often young people, who are involved in these nonviolent direct action protests. And the bottom line is that they are desperate, and rightly so. The situation is desperate or beyond desperate, if you will. Here's the cover of The Economist magazine last week. Say goodbye to 1.5 degrees, they say. Um, and, well, that's the reality. We're not going to stay below the safe upper limit of 1.5 degrees of global overheat. And in this situ situation, we all have to ask ourselves how we step up to the plate. The people in Just Stop Oil are choosing to do so in a very vigorous way. Uh, what I am choosing to do and what many others are choosing to do is something which is um, a little bit less full on and also extremely important. What we're calling for in the new moderate flank is for people to act in their communities, in their workplaces, in their businesses, in their institutions, to make the kind of changes that need to be made from bottom up. And when that happens at scale, then the young people will, I think, feel a, bit, a little bit less desperate. Alex, is that a fair characterization of your group? It is, yes. So um, Rupert's quite right. The situation is very desperate. I mean, already this year, we're predicted to lose 50% of our potato crop by the end of the year, and we've lost a third of our wheat crop. Our entire fruit and vegetable supply chain is on the brink of collapse next year because our reservoirs are not full enough this year. That's the sort of scale we're talking about in 2022. And when we see things at COP27 that Antonio Guterres, the Secretary General for the UN, says we're on a highway to climate hell with our foot on the accelerator, and when we see that 1.5 degrees is no longer a feasible target, we realize we have to do whatever we non-violently can to try and make change. Because as, as we do have our foot on the accelerator, so all we're asking for is for no new oil. Just take your foot off the accelerator and let's make change. That's what we're asking for. Okay, but there's a gulf of difference between that and attacking one-of-a-kind works of art that are totally irreplaceable and an important part of the cultural history and tapestry of the Western world. Does that not detract from the very message that you're trying to get across as it simply puts people's backs up? No, I don't believe that it does, actually. 
Um, we've had a lot of support from that action, a lot of controversy too, but it's because of that balance that it's got so many people talking about the climate crisis. When two people threw soup at that Van Gogh painting, it got more people talking about the climate crisis than when 33 million people got displaced in Pakistan. Why are people way more outraged about a painting that was protected, I may add, than those 33 million people who were not protected and lost their homes, their communities, their livelihoods? I'm from Scotland, that's six times the population of my entire country were really badly affected by these floods and have their lives ruined in that way. It's terrible. Sally, um, you are an associate uh, professor of art history. If we were to look back through history, we can go back to March 10th, 1914, and we would find Mary Richardson, who took a meat cleaver to the Rokeby Venus at the National Gallery here in London in order to make a political point with regards to women's suffrage and women's rights. So is it not a time-honored tradition for activists to go and attack works of art? Um, there certainly is a tradition of that. Um, more often than not, um, a lot of attacks on works of art are personal and not necessarily politically motivated. The Rokeby Venus is, is an exception. Um, and it was, you know, utilized by a, an active suffragette to draw attention to, to um, how women are viewed and exploited and weren't necessarily allowed to participate in the culture that that um, victimized them that way. So I think that there are affinities, certainly. Uh, in that case, the damage was repaired. I wouldn't say it was totally irreversible, but the damage was repaired. What's interesting to me about what they're doing, uh, what the climate activists are doing, is that, of course, the effects are reversible. And to me, that's part of the message of climate change. We may have gone too far past the brink, but some of it we can slow down or reverse. So. Uh, Alex, when you're when you're looking at these protests, what do you do when you how do you feel when you feel the kickback that comes through, the anger that there seems to be in the general public? Just to give you an indication of this, um, we sent one of our producers out onto the street, out into Trafalgar Square, just down from uh, the National Gallery, to ask members of the general public here in Britain what it what what opinions they had of Just Stop Oil. No, it doesn't work. It's a shame. It's stupid because they are attacking culture. I think they should keep doing it because it's good, important. It's an important issue. I think there are probably better ways to protest. You could protest in front of the directly in front of the oil companies, or in front of the big financial institutions that are connected with the oil companies. I don't think it's effective. That's. I think it's pretty clear. I think there, it has the opposite effect. I think it makes people less interested in changing things. It's definitely bringing attention to the issue, but I think it's also um, painting a somewhat negative portrayal of the people fighting for that issue by um, you know, having to get bodyguards and police involved and by attacking artwork in that way, I suppose, is maybe bringing a negative light to it, but it is definitely bringing attention to this really important issue. Now, the one thing that does come out of those clips is there seems to be a generational divide. People who are over the age of 30 seem to have much less sympathy for your movement than those under the age of 30. Is that almost by design on your part? Uh, no, it's not by design. And journalists like yourself often portray that in Just Stop Oil that we are a movement of young people, but that's not quite true. I've been on um, actions alongside 80-year-old vicars 60-year-old single mothers. Um, there's a, such a wide variety in Just Stop Oil that's not being covered. And sure, there are a lot of people who hate us because of, we're doing very controversial actions, fairly understandably. And I, I fully feel for those people because it is horrible to be disrupted in traffic. Um, but there's a lot of people who don't hate us as well. There was a recent Guardian article that reported that 66% of people, two thirds of people, actually support direct action or to tackle the climate crisis. It's because we know how urgent the situation is now, and we know how little our governments are doing. Last year at COP26, there wasn't even a mention of oil and gas in the final deal, which is insane to me. They have 636 delegates of oil and gas companies um, that are there representing them, and which is more than any national delegation. We are facing unbelievable levels of corruption and stalling, and it's about time we took action. So that's why we need more radical actions like this in order to not only shift the public conversation about the climate crisis, um, but to try and enforce change. We want everybody to get involved in however way they can. They don't need to throw soup at a painting, 
they can um, do exactly what Rupert is saying and do these more moderate methods as long as we all put pressure on our government to do more because that's what we really need. Rupert, talk to me about these more moderate methods. Yeah, so I'm talking about organizations such as Safe Landing. They are very inspiring to me. This is a bunch of airline pilots who are trying to get their industry to transition. Now, that's a really hard ask, and they're stepping up to it. I'm talking about the growing network of climate emergency centers that are springing up all over the place, starting in Britain and spreading abroad, where people are, it's a sort of one-stop shop for what you can do to tackle the climate and ecological emergency. There's a whole raft of things like this which are developing, which are coming through. And if there isn't one where you live or where you work or where you pray, then what I want to urge viewers to do is to set one up or to get involved. Or if you want, you can just come to our website, www.moderateflank.org. The key point is everyone needs to step up on this. The question that our children are going to be concerned about when they get to speak to us in 10 or 20 or 30 years time is, what did you do while, I, while there was time to make a really substantial difference before things got more out of hand as they may well do in the coming generation? And we all need to have an answer to that question. So to anyone who doesn't want to throw soup at a painting or whatever, and that's of course most people, I say, get involved, make the new moderate flank happen. We need to make the changes ourselves because our leaders are failing us. And when we do so, that will change the culture and it will put pressure on our leaders and on the political system. And if we imagine this happening at scale, then we're imagining the real kind of changes that we need. Sally, I saw, I've seen a lot of nodding from you as uh, two other guests have been talking. Uh, I'm sure you're very sympathetic to uh, the climate situation and some of the difficulties uh, uh, that there are here. Nonetheless, how do you feel about the fact that they are targeting art? Well, I think that the way that they've been doing it in galleries is a, a bit of a violation of the public trust. Um, you know, um, galleries are set up to protect and conserve works of art, and so it makes the work that they're doing harder. Um, but I do see the larger point, which is if we value those things, then we need to value the planet where we house them. So I can see that connection. I think initially when these incidents started, people were not, um, were not really understanding what the connection was to the debate about climate change because they were so shocking. They're almost like acts of performance art being staged in a gallery. So there was a chance of being of it being misinterpreted. Um, the fact that we're having a conversation about it now means that it was very effective, right? So it's, a, a I think, a moderate form of protest, but it seems shocking on the surface. Um, I guess the worry for people like me is what if something does get damaged? and what would be the consequences of that. But I mean, war is destroyed, I, I should say art is destroyed all over the world uh, by war and other kinds of conflict all the time. Well, for instance, uh, the Taliban, of course, uh, infamously destroyed several very, very important and culturally historic uh, Buddhist monuments and temples uh, across Afghanistan as they uh, went about their work. Alex, does it not make you uncomfortable because it is very easy for journalists to draw that parallel between yourselves and other groups that don't have a stellar, st stellar reputation? Well, of course it makes me un uncomfortable that you're even bringing that up as a suggestion, comparing us to the Taliban. I'm not. That's it's been insane. done all over social media. I am merely highlighting it to you and saying, what happens in your organization when these parallels are made? Well, obviously, it's horrible to hear things like that. And people keep asking us why we're targeting art. But that's because we have tried with petitions. We've tried with marches. We've tried taking more moderate actions, such as, um, you know, targeting the Chinese embassy, uh, the Shell headquarters, things like that. But that didn't get reported on the news. We spent two weeks at blocking about 53% of all oil in the southeast of England, causing massive material disruption. And that didn't really get reported much on the news either. Yet when two people threw soup at that Van Gogh painting, which was protected, that's what got people talking about the climate crisis. That's what got the media attention. In all honesty, if journalists like yourself were doing their job properly and reporting on how serious the situation is, we wouldn't have to do things like this. It shouldn't be on campaigners to tell people the bad news about the climate crisis. 
you should be doing that instead. How really? come I've never is there, heard? Really, is there anyone in, in Western Europe at this stage who is not aware of the seriousness of the situation? There difference. may be denialists who, who will argue against it, the counterflow the if other I way, may, Philip. but there is nobody who is not aware of the situation. Philip, if I may, you're right. People are aware of the climate crisis, but not of the scale of the climate crisis. There are more fossil fuel air pollution deaths than malaria, tuberculosis, and HIV combined. That is terrifying, and yet I've never heard that. I have never heard the fact that people are talking about the food shortages that are happening right now in the UK. This is 2022, and this is what we're facing. How come you didn't report on the fact that birds fell out of the sky in London during our heat wave? How come you never reported on the fact that it was 27 degrees at the North Pole this summer? So hot you would take your jumper off at the North Pole. Poll. These are terrifying images and they're not being talked about. Nobody is talking about the fact that by 2070, we're predicted to have 3.5 billion people, billion people on the move. A third of the entire global population living in parts of the world where it is too hot to live in. They cannot grow crops. They cannot have water. They cannot live. How is that not terrifying? That is definitely going to cause conflict and wars down the line. And if we took action right now, we could avoid and mitigate these horrible scenarios. That's why we need activism like this, because in all honesty, we are not going far enough. What we need is proportional response to the extinction of the human race. People always talk about the extinction of the human race, but they don't connect to it emotionally. It is okay. terrifying. If we were to look at the British political situation right now, between the major parties that there are, and obviously there are varieties of other parties out there as well, but the parties of government, generally speaking, are the Conservative Party, which is currently in power, who I assume you are not in favour of their current climate policies, and the Alternative Party, the Alternative Party of power is, generally speaking, the Labour Party. Keir Starmer, was asked just last week what he thought of uh, what he thought of Just Stop Oil, and he said, and I quote, "Go home. Let me just deal with Just Stop Oil because I think they're wrong. I think their action is wrong. I particularly think about the images we've seen of ambulances coming down the road and not being able to get through because people have glued themselves to the road." If the party of, uh, if you like, the alternative party of government, the most likely next UK government, is also becoming irritated with the tactics of Just Stop Oil, can you not see there might be difficulties for your movement in the future? So if I may um, of answer course. that. First, first of all, um, we have a blue lights policy. We do not glue in front of ambulances. Um, that's a myth. Secondly, um, although people hate us, the message gets through and people agree with the message. Keir Starmer actually added no new oil as a demand to their manifesto a couple months after we started. It doesn't seem very coincidental to me, in all honesty. Um, the Labour Party is not going far enough. Look, we are facing the worst cost of living crisis in, the, in history, right? And um, yet Keir Starmer is still not joining the picket line. He's still not defending nurses who are going on, on um, strike because they having to go to food banks. I'm at Newcastle University. My university is already having food banks. These are not Our things that necessarily tie together, though. Part of the reason for a cost of living crisis is complicated economic matters to do with money supply, a war in Ukraine, Ukraine being one of the world's largest exporters of grain. There are other factors here as well as the climate crisis. Uh, if I can just bring this yes, across to Rupert, just so I can bring I in some of the other guests for a second. Rupert, um, as a more moderate voice on that side, what do you do? Do you use the fact, uh, do you use it like a carrot and a stick and say, well, look, we're not just up oil, they're a little bit more aggressive than we are, but we have the same message, try these tactics instead, or do you deal with it another way? So the imperative starting point here is being clear about the gravity of the situation. Uh, and in that, I agree with the Just Stop Oil spokesperson who spoke just now. Obviously, the difference is how we tackle that. And I would say that there are relatively moderate methods, I mean moderate compared to Extinction Rebellion and Just Stop Oil, that haven't been properly tried yet. 
that people haven't been making efforts en masse in their professions, in their workplaces, in their businesses, for example, to transform every aspect of those. What is the product? What's the supply chain? Are we uh, resilient against uh, shocks? What are we doing with our profits? Are we allowing um, our uh, workers, fellow employees, etc., to um, join climate protests and so forth? These are the kinds of questions that every workplace and every business should now be asked. And it's employees, it's ordinary people, nearly everyone is involved in work in one way or another, or someone in their family is, who need to be asking these questions. And as I say, the crucial thing is for everyone to step up. Most people are not going to be interested in taking part in anything like what Just Up Oil are doing. But everyone needs to take part in something. It's not enough to just carve. As it were, Just Up Oil are throwing soup. You can't just throw barbs at Just Up Oil. You've got to actually put up yourself. You've got to do something. And when we all start doing something, when we all start doing enough, then actually things will start to change from the ground up. At the moment, if we were having this discussion perhaps 20 years ago, um, the general panel that we would have had on a news program would have been one person talking about climate change, one person saying we're not doing enough, and then the third person standing there saying, actually, there isn't a problem, it's all overblown, Al Gore is talking out of his hat, something in that kind of region. In panels these days, you generally have a person, a person from Just Stop Oil, a person such as yourself from a more moderate position, and then the third person is usually saying, look, with the best will in the world, 1.5 uh, degrees centigrade is already baked into the cake. We need to talk about engineering solutions. We need uh, to no, talk about... And that's why I immediately saw the disagreement in your face, which is why yeah. I want to pass. Is that, if you like, the new climate denialism? OK, good question. Yeah, I think that the drift towards geoengineering type solutions is extremely dangerous and worrying. Well, how we ought to respond to the, to the fact, and I'm afraid it is a fact, that I work with the, the leading climate scientists in the world at the University of East Anglia, and not one of them believes in private that 1.5 degrees is actually attainable. What we have to do with that fact is to be horrified by it and to be rocket fueled by it. It ought to impel all of us to action. And what that means, as I've said, can be whatever you are capable of doing without necessarily going outside the law, but you've got to do it. Everyone can take real action in their community, making their community resilient, building up its food supply, for example, uh, making our communities more local. Nearly everyone can take action where they work and so on and so forth. So we need to be rocket powered by the truth and we need to make sure that that truth doesn't lead us to reach for desperate pseudo solutions like geoengineering, but actually gets us finally to be serious. It's a terrible climate injustice. It's terrible news for our children and our grandchildren that 1.5 is dead. But we can turn that terrible news into something great if it actually impels us all to get serious at last on this issue, which is the determinative issue. It is the issue which our children and grandchildren will judge us by. Alex, let me, uh, let me cross to you. Yes, no, I just wanted to say I fully agree with Rupert. We have all these solutions available to us, such as insulating homes, which cut people's energy bills in half, subsidizing public transport, tidal power, because we live on an island. Why wouldn't we be using that? Um, taxing the big oil polluters because they make ridiculous, ridiculous amounts of money and yet we're still subsidizing them with millions and millions every single week. We have all these solutions. I, I would know I'm doing my PhD in green hydrogen production, but they're just not being used. And that's why what Ripper and I are saying, correct me if I'm wrong, Ripper, is that we need activism. We need to put pressure on our government because massive resistance is the only solution that really matters right now because none of the others are being used. What we do as scientists well, I, I means nothing if the government's that. not willing to implement say, it. Yeah, I would say uh, what, we, what we need is for a, a huge mass of people, far greater than has so far got involved, to get involved. And some of those will get involved in radical activism, and some of those will get involved in more moderate action. And I would say that can be millions, um, millions, tens of millions. That's what we actually need. A Sally, truly, truly mass movement. Sally, if I can pass across to you for the last word, what can art do to put itself on the other side of this rather than being a target, but uh, if you like, move into assisting uh, the climate debate in other ways? Well, I think by welcoming um, um, activists, by welcoming activist art, by welcoming organizations 
um, into the gallery space that um, produce work that is a commentary or is a reflection of um, the climate change crisis. I mean, there are um, many, many contemporary artists who work um, with that kind of subject matter. And I do think that that is um, welcomed in a lot of, um, you know, smaller galleries and stuff. I think the large institutions need to make a commitment um, to um, running clean institutions. Um, there are inevitably connections to big money and that's connections to the oil industry. And that's a, a bit of a problem, I think, in the institutional context. But I do think that if, you know, world class institutions take a position, that is part of the activism that we're talking about. Sally, thank you very much for joining me. Alex and Rupert, thank you very much for your time as well. Remember, you can see more discussion and debate on our YouTube channel. Search for Roundtable TRT World on YouTube. But from me now and from the entire team here, thank you for watching and goodbye.